Okay. Does this work? Hi, everyone. Let's get started. Um, yeah, so you should have seen my announcement, but just to recap it, next week I'm going to be traveling on Tuesday, but I'll be back for Thursday's lecture. Uh, I have to move my office hours to Friday due to a one-time conflict, and um, please sign up for your projects in groups of three. Uh, and there was a slot there to say, like, if you have a preferred date, Tuesday or Thursday. And also, I just added one right before this lecture asking, um, so we have to schedule some out of the lecture time, like I said last week, last lecture, I don't know, because uh, we don't have enough slots inside the lecture. So uh, we'll make some time on Wednesday and Friday for online presentations. So if you have availability, then please write it in the spreadsheet as well. Um, and I have to edit the rubric because I think one of the things in the rubric was eye contact, which doesn't really make that much sense for an online presentation. So yeah, thank you. Any questions, concerns? Okay, great. Yeah, if there's any questions, you can just feel free to post it on EdStem. Um, yeah, let's get started. Today is graph optimization. I had fun writing this, so I hope that it's also fun for you. Okay, so we can start. What is a graph? So a graph is an abstraction that uh, connects different entities with these abstraction called vertices and edges. So vertex is the like the item that is being connected and edge is the connection between the items. And the meaning of the edge is different in different applications. Like this is an example with some people, Alice, Bob, Carol, and so on. And their connections, like if this was a social network, this could be like a friendship relationship or family relationship or anything like that. So uh, that is what vertices, so edges just connect the vertices and a graph abstraction has, it's pretty powerful. You can capture a lot of things using the simple method. Edges can be directed, which means that the relationship can be one way or both ways. In the previous example, it was undirected. And with directed, we just denote that with arrows on the end of the edge. And here, this is directed in both directions. Edges can also be weighted, which means that uh, a weight is, in some sense, like some notion of strength or distance, uh, depending on the application. So if your graph was the distance between cities, the weight would be like the total distance in miles or some unit of distance. Uh, if it was flight costs, so the edge is how much it would cost them to fly between the two nodes in the graph or two vertices, which are also called nodes. So here, like this would be an example of $75 to fly this way. And these, this is a directed graph, that one is undirected. Vertices and edges can have types and they can have metadata. So in the previous example, the type was just one single int or float, but they can also have much larger metadata associated with the nodes and the edges. Um, here, like this node is Vinci, and he has several different items attached, like birthday, death day, age, so on. Um, and this is especially important in, in GNNs. So recently graph neural networks are popular and in GNNs, like the edge weights and the node weights are much huger than one item. Like they can be vectors of size 100 or even 1000 elements. So the, the size depends on the graph and the application. A few properties of real world graphs, uh, often they are public, the publicly available ones are big, but not so big. So for example, like for social network, this is the publicly available Twitter graph. 41 million vertices and 1.5 billion edges. Um, so that's on the order of gigabytes. This Yahoo graph is also on the order of tens of gigabytes. And this is the web graph, the biggest commonly available, the biggest publicly available graph today. That is on the order of 500 or so gigabytes. So, and for these, the weights are just like one value. So you can see that they're pretty big, like they're on the order of gigabytes. And this is coming, coming up on like a terabyte almost. But it's not it's not gigantic, and uh, probably companies have bigger graphs like uh, Facebook and stuff like that. But those are not publicly available, so uh, these are the ones that we have to work with from an academic standpoint. Uh, graphs like last time we talked about sparse matrix vector graphs are also sparse, just like matrices, which means that the number of edges present in the graph is much less than n squared, which is the total number of edges you could possibly have. Graph degrees can be highly skewed, so this is different from matrices that we saw, like we saw a lot of formats that were like diagonal or blocked uh, for graphs, you often have the skew degree distribution 
where most of the vertices have very low degree. Like if this is the, like for example, the Twitter graph, the y-axis is how many vertices have this degree and the x-axis is the degree. Most of the people are up on this left side where you have few connections and very few people are up on this right side where like famous people have a lot of connections. So this is called the power law degree distribution. And that means that uh, the, there are a few vertices with, there's this heavy tail. Um, there's a few vertices with degree, like in the Twitter graph, the highest degree is on the order of millions, but most of them, the average degree is like on the order of tens. That's uh, a property of graphs that is widely studied. Okay, um, a few applications of graphs. Social networks are this classical application. For example, you want to find your friends who went to the same high school. Uh, you want to find your common friends with someone. So that would mean um, like what neighbors do you have in common? Social networks can recommend people who you might know, but you're not currently connected to, probably through your current friends. And they can recommend you products. So if people like you for some sense of like in the network, like something, they might also recommend you that thing that they liked. Um, another example is finding clusters. So uh, clustering algorithms try to find these groups of vertices in the graph that are well connected internally. So they partition the set of vertices into groups such that the groups are well connected within the group, but not super, they're poorly connected outside of the group. Uh, and this is used in trying to find communities in the graph, like people with similar interests, detecting fraudulent websites, document clustering. So finding similar documents using some similarity measure based on the edges, uh, unsupervised learning. So like a classic algorithm for a supervised learning, like the most famous one is k-means. Uh, that's basically clustering. Oh, does that make sense? Are there questions? Great. Uh, we talked about representations a lot last week or a couple of days ago. So I'm just gonna do a very brief recap. Uh, we're gonna, when I come back, we'll do a full lecture on graph representation. So we're gonna mostly talk about algorithms and how to implement algorithms on sparse graphs today, but we can assume that they're best, uh, they're all implemented today on top of compressed sparse row format, which is the same as CSR that we talked about last lecture. So to recap, uh, the graphs are sparse, which makes it worth it to sort in CSR. The graphs are static, so um, the, there are no updates to it. And we'll see later that one of the most common operations that you want to do when doing graph algorithms is basically you have a neighbor or you have a vertex and you want to look at all the neighbors of that vertex and you want to do some processing on that list. So that's really well suited to the CSR representation because this is a cache efficient representation. You want to scan over the neighbors and all of them happen to be contiguous uh, and often ordered, which is also convenient. So. Yeah, and this is just a recap of what CSR looks like. So you have two arrays. This is the unweighted case. You have offsets and edges. I think this is called pointer and in in the in the matrix case, but it's the same thing. The meaning of offsets is where does this vertex, this neighbor list, start in the edges array? So and the vertex IDs are implicit. So vertex zero has neighbors two, seven, nine, and sixteen. So it has degree four. Vertex one has only zero as the neighbor, vertex two has one, six, nine, 12, and it would have a few more because you would get the degree by subtracting the one to your right from yourself. Um, so this is the start, but to get the degree, you would just subtract like the one to your right from yourself, and that would be how long your list is. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, is there a way, I mean, and I can probably not necessarily I was thinking you would like to represent like a completely disconnected vertex list? Uh, yeah, it would just be like, if one was disconnected, for example, then you would just write four and four. Four, okay. And so, so like, like querying two, you have to check the one previously before you like, like if two also have four, you have to check previously, you have to like check one to make sure it's like, so like, or. No, then there would just be no, no, like one would have no neighbors. But you have to check where the like the like top and bottom is, right? You have to check the value. You have, like 
if you want to iterate over the neighbors of two, for example, oh, okay. you have to look at two and three. So you have, is that the issue? Like that you have to look at two? No, I, that makes sense. You have to have a yeah. yeah, You don't have to look left. You only have to look right. Uh, so I just duplicate the duplicate size. So they can uh, within one neighbor, like within one neighbor list, they would not. But yeah, yeah. within the entire thing, they would. Yeah, because the source is implicit. Good. Just out of curiosity, with like in the edges, is there ever a use case of like having them sorted or anything? Is that like something that's? Uh yes, we will get there. Yeah, there is a case. Uh, there's a use case to having them sorted. Um. We'll talk about compression later. That's one common reason that you might want that. Could you clarify what the bullet that says need to scan over neighbors is being instead of where to scan? Yes, I will talk about it way more later, but um, the high level is that often when you implement algorithms, one common uh, primitive is uh, I have some set of active vertices or at least one active vertex, and I want to look at all the neighbors of that active vertex and add them to some queue for the next round. Like if you think about breadth research, um, that is like a direct application of what I'm calling scan. Does that make sense? Um, if you still have questions like later on, then feel free to stop me. Thanks. Good. Okay. All right. So uh, if there are any questions, feel free to speak up because this is important because like the just like in SPIMV, the implementation of the algorithm depends on the representation. So um, we're assuming CSR, which is the most straightforward, a most straightforward representation. Um, yeah, because it allows us to do the scan easily. And this particular picture is for, for the rest of that, right? Because we are, otherwise we would have had also a neighbor for, for, for two, vertex two would have had a neighbor. Yes, this is directed graph. You could just yeah, you could just duplicate them like in reverse for the undirected case. For yeah. I guess um if you wanted to keep in and out, you would keep two copies of CSR. Because this lets you easily scan over out neighbors. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted in neighbors, it's not so easy. So we just keep one unweighted graph. This is for unweighted. If there were weights, there would be like a third array of, uh, in SpinView, it's called values. Here, they're called weights. That's the same thing. Okay. All right. So we are going to implement a graph algorithm using CSR. Okay, so to recap, breadth research, this classical graph algorithm, you start with the source vertex S, and you want to visit the, all the vertices in the graph that are connected to S in order of their distance from S, which is your source. And so there are two possible ways that you can do outputs. One is you just output the vertices in, or several ways, more than two actually, that you can output. One is the vertices in the order in which you visit them. Um, this is like, it's called like BFS order. And another one is you can output this array of, um, of distances where each entry is the distance from that vertex to the source vertex. So that's like how many hops each vertex was from source. So in this graph, if D was your source, B, C, and E, B, C, E are all one hop from D. A is two hops from D, either this way or this way. So that's why A is two over there. Um, another one is you can explicitly output the BFS tree. So uh, the BFS tree in array order where every element, so you have this array equal to the length of the number of nodes you have, and each entry inside would have the parent in the BFS tree. So um, in this example, the parent of D would just be D, the parent of B, C, and E would also be D, and then the parent of A uh, here would be B. Does that make sense? Um, and these two probably are the most common one, like distance and parents. Uh, from a benchmarking point of view, it's probably important to say which one it is. From a correctness point of view, you can convert parents into distance easily, but not really vice versa. Yeah. So breadth research is this 
graph algorithm, and it's used as a subroutine in a lot of different other graph problems, like between the centrality, centricity, eccentricity estimation, max flow, and a bunch of other ones, cycle detection, so on. Does the algorithm make sense to everyone? All right, so we're gonna do this in serial first and then we'll do it in parallel later. Uh, so suppose, like I said, we are going to compute this parents array or the BFS tree. So first we have to init a, an array of parents equal to the number of nodes we have, which is N. And then we are also going to init a queue, which is the current uh, current vertex that we are current, like the active vertex that we're currently visiting. And the maximum length that this could possibly be is N. So we're gonna initialize it to N and we're going to set parent, we, this is the initialization, we set them all to negative one in the beginning. This means unvisited for the purposes of BFS. And to start, we have, we get some source vertex like in the signature, so we're going to set the head of the queue equal to the source vertex. And we're going to set the parent of the source vertex equal to source vertex. Because this is like a special case. None of the other ones will have themselves as the parent, but because it's the source, you need to mark it visited somehow. And then these are just saying like, how long is the queue right now? Queue front and queue back. And so this is, this is like the, basically the way this is gonna work is that until the queue is empty, we're always just gonna look at the front of it and add all the neighbors of whatever was in the front that have not yet been visited. So assuming that our graph is in CSR, we have offsets and edges, because this is the unweighted case, and we have n vertices and m edges. So like I said, while you have stuff in the queue, while queue front is not equal to the queue back, you dequeue what is currently in the front, and you, look at the degree because this is how this is telling you how long you have to iterate over. So degree is what we just said, you look to the thing on your right in the CSR and yourself and then you subtract. So that's offsets current plus one minus offsets of current. And we are going to iterate through all the neighbors of this vertex that is currently active. We look at the neighbor here, uh, edges is the neighbors, offsets current plus i is the current index. So we basically like, we looked at the start and the end of the neighbor list in CSR. And if that neighbor has not yet been visited, so if the parent is negative one, then we are going to add it into the queue. Yeah, so uh, you probably have seen this algorithm before. Uh, the only different part is that this specific code to iterate through the CSR the specific code assumes that you have a CSR representation. If you could, like, probably a better way to code this is uh, you implement some layer of abstraction where you iter where you implement like an iterator, basically. Um, but because you know something about the actual memory representation, you can do this direct array access. So degree is the number of augmented. Yes, in this case, this is uh, directed. So we're doing like BFS tree based on the echoing edges. So um, yeah, so one question is, what is, this, what is the most expensive part of this? So there's several options. Uh, we had to touch every node at least once. We have to touch every edge also at least once. Um, so yeah, and we have to touch, for every edge, we have to check the parent array to see if the node at the end point has been visited. So that is equal to m random accesses because there are m edges and each one has to check this parent array and we're not guaranteed that they're ordered. So I guess this is also answering a question like, does it help if they're ordered? Not from a correctness standpoint, but from a performance standpoint. Like if they were ordered and close, these might be in the same cache line. That could help. Um, yeah. And this is the most expensive part because random access costs more than sequential access. So you have to touch M edges in the CSR representation, but those are sequential, like you're iterating through the neighbor list. So I claim that accessing the parent array is more expensive than accessing the CSR. Obviously it depends like exactly what the access pattern is, like you might have a nice input, um, but on average, this is like the, the worst case thing that you can claim.
Okay. So if we want to analyze the number of cache misses that this program takes, and assuming that we have nothing in the cache to begin with, and our cache size is less than the less than the parent's array size, um, we have 64 byte cache lines and four byte ints. So there's several parts. The first part is initializing this, but this thing, this parent array is contiguous. So it has length equal to the number of nodes. So that would be n over 16, because we can hold 16 elements per cache line. Second part, it's dequeuing this part. We're going to dequeue every node at most once. So that would be n over 16 also. It's upper bounded by n over 16. Actually, it could be less because if some stuff got visited already, like you wouldn't have to add it. Um, actually, no, it's exactly over 16, but you may not just add it again. And for accessing the offsets array, um, you have to access every offset exactly once. For the edges array, you have to e access it equal to number of nodes plus number of edges over 16, because your edge access is contiguous. And like I said before, M for accessing this parent array, because you're doing random access into it. And yeah, so this is, if you add them all up, that's what you get. So this is a question, how can you reduce the cache misses? Um, probably by focusing on this thing. This thing? Um, because for every node, every node will enter the queue at most once. And every time it enters the queue, you have to look at the, the degree. You have to look at um, how long you have to iterate over its neighbor list. And you have to look at its start in the neighbor list. Or you have to look at its start in the edges array. And you have to look at how many iterations you have to go in the edge array. Uh, no, because they're not necessarily contiguous. Like the order in which you visit the vertices is not necessarily an order. But usually, um, number of edges is bigger than number of nodes. So you probably want to focus on this part. No. Oh, you're just asking about like the the analysis. Um, maybe, maybe I can give a hint. So um, we want to focus on accessing the parent array. So right now, each parent takes 32 bits. Uh, can we reduce the number of bits somehow? Or like maybe we can add some auxiliary thing to reduce the number of the amount of data that you have to access to do this check. So basically all you, you have to store the parents like the int, but you also have to, you're also checking here. You don't care exactly what the int is in this check. You only care that it's not negative one. That makes sense. Maybe you want to somehow like adjust the parents rate so that it's not like a bit for a note, but like something like a parent ID maps to like contiguous uh, rate of the the nodes that I can parent on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. I can keep going. Um, so the the idea is kind of like you said, like uh, try to reduce the space for the parent array. This example uses a bit vector, so. It, we said that you cannot fit 32 times n in the cache, but like, what if you can fit exactly n bits in the cache? Um, so you can have some auxiliary thing. You have both, you have, you still have to store parent, but you can make a bit vector of size n, and then the bit vector tells you, has it been visited or not? So that's way, one way to possibly reduce the cache misses uh, if, you, if, if this was true, that the bit vector would fit in the cache. Yes, a visit array like zero ones. Yeah, this is true. But here, like parent is doubling as visited in the initial implementation. So we don't need 
the value. Like we never used the value that was in parent. Yeah, but you still have to return it. Yeah, but um, so you still have to you still have to look at it if you go into this part like parent neighbor is parent. But if you don't, if it has already been visited, you don't ever have to look at its parent again. So, so each vertex would have like two things. It would have like a zero or one telling you whether it's visited and its actual parent, which is 32 bits. And then oh. the first time it's visited, you set the parent 32 bits, but then like the subsequent times you can just check the bit array. Wouldn't this cost this element from this update from other from another uh, property that uh, invented the cache? Right now we have one thread, so not yet. Um, yes, if you, it may cause some like fault sharing issues if you were to do it in parallel, but right now we have one thread. Good question. Um, why is it n? Yeah. Because if you can, it takes you n cache matches to bring in the entire bit vector. And then subsequent accesses to the bit vector are in cache, so they don't don't count in the analysis. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Um, yeah, and this is just the the bit vector implementation. So you also have to make this make this visited, and you have to do a little bit of bit manipulation to it. So um, you pay a little bit of bit arithmetic, but you save the memory access, and maybe you come out overall. And it turns out that this version is faster if your m is big enough relative to the number of nodes, which makes sense. Um, usually in practice for sparse graphs, m is like a constant factor in n. But it's like it's not like two n. It's like maybe ten or something. All right. So yeah, does that make sense? Are the questions? Okay. So uh, that was on one thread. So we're gonna move to try to do it in parallel. And the high level way this is gonna work is that rather than keeping a queue where you only look at one thing at a time, like you only dequeue the front, you keep what is called a frontier, which is a set of all active vertices at a time. And the way you build the frontier is you start with the frontier in one step. And to build the frontier in the next step, you look at all the outgoing nodes from the current frontier and you add everything that has not been visited into your frontier for the next time. And then you can process everything in the frontier in parallel because um, you're just like you're just exploring the BFS tree in parallel. All the nodes, you can visit all the edges of the nodes in the queue separately. So you can parallelize over the vertices in the frontier as well as the outgoing edges. Yes, it's shared between the grids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's it raises some issues like races and load balancing. If it's it is shared among all the threads, so you have to deal with these things. It's harder than just maintaining the one queue that we had, where you can enqueue at the end with no issues. Okay, so to do the initialization, it changes slightly now. Instead of a queue, which is just like an array of size n that we had before, we need several arrays for frontier, frontier next, and the degrees of the things in the frontier. So these are all, you can think of them as arrays equal to the length of the, the number of nodes you have. But uh, in practice, the frontier is probably much smaller than that. But um, from a correctness standpoint, it is not wrong to make them arrays of length n. Just like before, we initialize the parents array. All of them are visited in the beginning, so they're negative one. And you put the source in the, in the frontier, just like we did in the queue. The frontier size in the beginning is one, and the parent of the source is source. So this initialization is of the actual queue is like pretty much similar to what we had before in the serial case. Right. 
so this is this is a high level picture of how it's going to work, and then we can look at the code. Kind of, it's kind of like the serial case in that you keep going until the frontier is not empty. So previously this was the queue, but now it's a frontier. But it's more complicated because it's in parallel. So in parallel for everything, all the vertices that you have in the frontier, you're going to copy all the neighbors of the vertex in the frontier into frontier next, which is just another array and only if they have not yet been visited. So this is similar to the queuing case, but just now it's in parallel. And then you set B as the parent of all its neighbors in the parents array if it doesn't yet have a parent. So th this is similar to the serial case, but there are, and then in the next round, you set frontier next to frontier. But there are several issues. Uh, first one is that you want to copy all the neighbors into frontier next, but you have many vertices in parallel. And so you need to know where you're trying to, wh like which memory location you have to copy the, verti the vertex neighbors into. Does that problem make sense? And the second problem is, what if you have multiple vertices in the frontier that have the same neighbor? Like which parent should get written into the parents array? So to solve the first issue, uh, I think that everything is prefix sum, but we're going to use prefix sum. So the first problem, like I said, is how do you know where we're going to copy the neighbors into for every vertex in the frontier? And you can find the degree using just the CSR representation, like you use offsets array. And so this is this is like, um, I think we did something like this before, maybe in the lecture. But the way the way it works is that you, in parallel over everything in the frontier, you make this, you populate this degrees array and every entry in the degrees array has ha like the degree of that vertex corresponding to that index in the frontier. Uh, isn't the like CSR an offset array already prefix sum? Um, yes, but you cannot use directly the offset array because you're not copying everything like oh. prefix sum over the sorry the offset array is prefix sum over the entire graph, and basically what you're doing is like populating a subgraph. Does that make sense? So yeah, so that's why you need the degree. And yeah, so like I said, basically you're building a subgraph for your next frontier. Um, and so you you store the degrees, you do exclusive scan, and this is exactly the locations that you need to write the neighbors of the vertex for each slot into. That's that's where you start. And then that's gonna pack them all to the front. You could like if you had the max degree, you could make your frontier equal to like max degree times max size of frontier, but that would be huge. So uh, you probably, it's probably better to do this because this is bounded above by N. Yeah, what exactly is packing E rate up to scan uh, E? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is packing E rate up to scan uh, E. Um, you, you have a set of vertices and you're trying to write all their neighbors in one contiguous array, like mm -hmm. all next to each other. So using the degree of each vertex, you do an exclusive scan on it. And then this is telling you where in the starting, what starting point in the destination array you start writing that vertex's neighbors into. Okay. You got it? Okay. Uh, but this is not what is the neighbor is going to be. Sorry? If there are like some paired neighbors. Yes, this is, not re this is not removing the duplicates. This is just, uh, there may be duplicates after this. This is just storing them in a packed way. Good. Yeah, so it doesn't it doesn't solve all the issues, but it solves the first one. Okay. So yeah. Um this is the actual code to run the algorithm. While frontier while we have something in the frontier, we set up the degrees like we just did. Uh, this is the parallel for to pack them in. So we set up the degrees. And this is just you iterate over the vertices in the frontier in parallel, and you start writing their neighbors into the frontier next. Uh, this is just the starting points that we computed before. This thing is going to make sure that we only write one, and I'll explain how it works. And frontier next is shared. Right? Frontier next issue. Yeah. Frontier and frontier next issue. That's why you have to do this degree thing. 
because the doing the prefix sum on the degree ensures that everybody has like a different starting and ending point. So we're going to use this degree thing that we computed prefix sum on. And we use index or degrees to start writing into frontier next. So you can see like frontier next is index plus j, where j is zero up to degree. Okay. And so this uh, this if is there's a lot going on. There's two parts. The first part is just if the parent if this neighbor has not been explored, so if it's negative one, then then we got to continue. And like you said, there might be duplicates. So that's why that's why there's a second part, which is using compare and swap. And I will explain what compare and swap is. Yeah. So like I said, the second problem was other vertices in the frontier can have this can share the neighbor, and only one should be like the winner. Uh, and if you're if it is not, if it has been explored, or if you're not the winner, don't add it. Only one thread, only one parent should add the thing into the frontier next. Okay, and then the last part, like you might have some negative ones uh, because some don't win or some have already been explored. How would you, you want to filter out all the negative ones? How would you do it using prefix them? one to every entry in Frontier Next? Yeah. Okay. And then, drop, and then prefix some on that. And then, and then you have uh, like duplicates in the array, right, which would be like word zero and zeros. And then, uh, like, oh, I see. Oh, okay. I see. So you're saying like, if two mm -hmm. things next to each other are the same, then you can know they're duplicates. Or you can know the one on the left was negative one. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that would work. That's not what I thought, but it would work. And then in the end, you would just subtract one again. Yeah, actually, it would work. I used like, I used like filler space because this. Um, so if you basically like, say this is your frontier next. If you have negative one, uh, you can make this bit array, and the bit array is one if it's real and zero if it's not. And then you can do prefix them on this bit array. Um, I guess the advantage of this approach is you need to know, like basically you're trying to pack all the actual things to the front. And with your thing, uh, it is true that you can know what is real, but it is not true that you know where to put it in the packed thing. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, so this, uh, but this comes at the cost of using the bit array, like you have to use a little extra space, um, but this will tell you like every, the pink ones are the real ones and the slot of the pink one of after your, Prefix them is the slot where you should write it in the packed, packed to front thing. Make sense? I think yeah, why exactly we wouldn't uh, know where to put it in. Uh, in well, because if you have like thing. negative one, negative one, and then some and then, value, value. and then more negative ones, then it'll all be, you know. So like, value. yeah, so what you said is like ignore that you have flags for a second. You add one to everything. So this would be like 0, 5, 9, 0, 0, so on. Uh, and then like you do prefix sum. And this would be like 0, 5, 9, 9, 9. Mm -hmm. And then so like from 9, 9 and 9, 9 here, like these two, you would know that the thing on the right is 0. Mm -hmm. But how would you know which index this was in the overall list of real things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, there were. I guess I, it's subtle, like what exactly the requirements are. But yeah, if you you want to filter them to the front, 
uh, that one works if you don't have extra space. And then um, you could do a second pass. And then basically the second pass would generate flags. And then you do. But then I guess you would just do it in the first place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, that was good. That was really good. Um, yes. Is this an operation known as stream compaction, or is that something else? That is an operation known as stream compaction, okay. yes. It's also called filter. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. So um, once you do this flex, once you do the scan, then you, uh, in the next frontier, the result of the flag scanning is exactly the index of where you should write the thing. Can you put the go to the slide Yeah. Uh, so yeah, from like we need this comparing swap for uh, all this problem of duplicates, uh, and you will explain now what, what it will be. But what exactly is the problem of like suppose we traverse like from the first frontier to the second one, and then we end up in a situation where like one node comes to the some node, and then the second one also comes to the same one. How exactly does it like ruin the whole algorithm? Like because eventually we will still end up traversing the whole graph, right? Uh, we wouldn't be doing this like the most optimal way mm -hmm. because we're like visiting the same node twice. Uh, but does it really break the algorithm that we had or is it just like the best? If you are counting distances, it does not necessarily break it. If you are counting parents, it may not, may not end up with a valid BFS3. Yeah. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, and also there's a performance issue if you keep adding the same thing into the frontier. Yeah. So yeah, now I'll explain what compare and swap is. Compare and swap is a basic atomic that compares, you give it three elements, or it has three parameters. It has a pointer, it has an old value, and a new value. And the meaning of compare and swap is you compare what is in the pointer to old value. And if it is equal to old value, you move, you replace old value with new value at that address. Um, yeah, and it does that whole thing atomically. So, like I said, if the pointer is not equal to old, just do nothing. Otherwise, you replace old with new. And then you return. And you can use this to implement mutexes. So if your mutex is just like 0 or 1, set or unset, you would use CAS on 0 and 1 in your mutex. You can also use it for more complicated stuff. You can use it for lock-free and wait-free algorithms. It's a built-in function. Yeah, it's a built-in function. It's in. It's just in like C. Yeah. Um, so going back to this thing, compare and swap pointer, old, new. So only one is going to win this because one of them is going to win this. And then if there are others trying to do this, they will see that this is no longer negative one and they just exit. Okay. Okay, so... Span analysis. So we talked about work in span before. The span is the longest path through the parallel computation. You can do this analysis. The, uh, so the, the span in parallel is how many iterations through the frontier you have to do, and how long is the span of each frontier computation. So that is the number of iterations of the front, like how many frontier rounds are you going to do? That's bounded above by the diameter, which is the longest path in your graph. Uh, each iteration takes log m span. This is really generous upper bound because uh, this is saying like at most you will have m things in your frontier in parallel. So you do the or m outgoing edges. Uh, you take log m span in the silk model to go through those prefix sum so on. Span is d times log m. And the work. The sum of the frontier sizes is n because you visit every node at exactly once or up to once. Every edge is traversed once, so you have m total visits. Uh, the prefix sum on each iteration is equal, is proportional to the size of the frontier, so that is theta n in total because, like the sum sum of overall all the frontiers is n, and the work of the filter is proportional to the number of edges because you uh, go through every edge at most once, so that is bounded above by m. The work in total, you add them all up, m plus n, m is edges, n is vertices. Yes, let me go back. Yeah, uh, I think like 
in the very beginning, you had a slide where you showed what the front view is, and then the uh, next layer contained all of the vertices, but like actually it's not the case, right? That was just like for illustration because actually, um, yeah, you can go back. Yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's. So like the first round, the frontier is just source. The next round, the frontier would. Oh, okay, it was like just everything. Like, oh, one hop. Okay, I see. One hop, yeah. two hop. Okay. Okay. So this is a, yeah, these are just some performance plots. There's a random graph. You have 10 to the eight random edges. This is average degree of 10. And y-axis is speed up. X-axis is threading. Um, yeah, so one thread time is different from serial time because one thread time is just you run the parallel algorithm and you set num threads equal to one. But serial is like a different algorithm because you had a queue. And this is the speed up. And the serial BFS is 54% faster than the parallel BFS on one thread because you have the overhead of doing the frontier like um, prefix sum and everything like that. But of course, you cannot scale the th serial one with threads. So there's a parallel one. Um, I don't want to talk about this. You can do it non-deterministically. Non um, I'm just going to leave that in the slides for later. Uh, yeah. Questions? OK. So yeah, so next I want to talk about this algorithm called Direction Optimizing Breath for Search. Uh, so this is like a performance thing. The previous thing that we had was already correct. Um, this is just trying to make it even faster. Okay, so uh, the intuition or like the idea behind direction optimization is that the frontier grows really big and then it shrinks really small over the course of your iterations. So this is just some examples. Um, this is your frontier iteration number and this is the frontier size in terms of vertices. So for a random graph and parallel graph, they both get really big and then they drop down. Um, and most of the work is done when the frontier is huge because the work is proportional to the number of out edges you have to traverse. And that is big when you have more vertices to traverse. Okay. So the algorithm that we just did uh, is called top-down BFS. And the way that top-down works is exactly what we just did. Like you have the frontier and you add the next visited interior frontier modulo some fancier packing. And yeah, and most of the work is actually in checking if you have visited the endpoint already. And that is good for small frontiers, um, but the updates, we just did compare and swap. So the updates to the parent array is atomic. And especially when the frontier is large, you may have a lot of contention to try to do the compare and swap on the same vertex. So if, you, if the frontier is large, there's a lot of wasted work for everybody trying to do the atomic swap and there can only be one winner. So they came up uh, in this work with something called bottom-up BFS, which is a case for, uh, it's supposed to be used for when the frontier is large. And basically, instead of iterating over the things in the frontier, you iterate over all the vertices in parallel. And it's kind of it's kind of like in reverse, like rather than checking everything in the frontier and doing the out neighbors, you check all your vertices. And if your vertex has not yet been visited, then you put it on the frontier. Does that make sense? So, yeah, so this would not work uh, if the frontier is small, because then like, um, yeah, this would only work when the frontier is similar to the size of no number of nodes it, from a performance standpoint. From a correctness standpoint, you can just do all top down or all bottom up. And yeah, so you iterate over all the vertices in parallel. And if the parent, if you have not visited that vertex, you look at all the neighbors of that vertex. If the neighbor is on the frontier, you set the parent equal to you set the parent equal to that neighbor, and you put V on frontier next. So there's no atomic operations here because the winner is already determined by what is on the frontier, and there's only one unique thing on the frontier.
And yeah, so this is the performance. X, Y is time. Down is good. X is step, like frontier steps. And you can see, yeah, blue is top down and yellow is bottom up. And you can see that top down is bad when the frontier is huge. Uh, top down is better when the frontier is small. This is top down there. Um, yeah. And the, yeah, so this work is trying to answer this question, which variant should you use? And it's not always clear. It depends on the frontier size. Um, so this is called direction optimizing DFS. And the high level idea is that you, based on, you still do these frontier rounds, but you choose which way you go, depending on how big the frontier is. Uh, and usually in practice, this threshold of the frontier size n over 20, where n is the number of nodes, is pretty good. Okay, so every round you check your size. If you're small, you do the regular thing, top down. If it's big, you do bottom up. Uh, previously, we were using sparse integers to represent the frontier. Like we were just directly writing which vertices were in the frontier. So that's called sparse integers. That's in top down version. For the bottom up version, since uh, since the number of vertices is similar to the total number of vertices, we can use a byte, we can use a bit array. Um, this is the corresponding bit array for the sparse integer array. You put a one for the vertex that is there. And then yeah, so this is a byte array. You don't have to do bit level operations. You can make this a bit vector and then do bit operations to access it. And one complicated thing in the underlying algorithm is that you basically keep both these variants around. And depending on if you're doing top down or bottom up, you switch, you convert between them. Um, yeah. But we not switch between the methods on the way around. I mean, if we take the top down about a month, then we can switch the two right? No, you can, oh, so in each frontier it. round, you you pick top right. down or bottom up based on the size. And if you switch from what you were before, you have to convert the representation. Oh, okay. So basically, yeah. in each round, we can choose the most of them. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's what that's exactly what they're doing. And then they do this performance testing. Um, Y-axis is time. X-axis is, these are just two types of graph, random graph and parallel graph. And direction optimizing one is green, and it's lower than both bottom up and top down. <clears throat> and you can see that the benefits are dependent on the kind of graph. Like the benefits are lower for parallel graph compared to random graph. And it doesn't help you if the frontier is always small, because then you would just always be doing top down. What are parallel graphs? Parallel graphs are like uh, skewed graphs. like like average degree is low. It's like the thing in the beginning where it's like the degree distribution is like that. Um, some few vertices have high degree and most mm -hmm. have low degree. Mm -hmm. um, so that is like how you do it for one algorithm. There is this graph processing framework called LIGRA that generalizes this direction optimization to arbitrary, not arbitrary algorithms, like many more algorithms than BFS. This idea of like switching the frontier size based on the switching the switching the approach of how you populate the frontier based on the frontier size, and it does this generalization. Um, you pass it in graph frontier update, which is some update function for every vertex, and a condition, which is telling you under what condition should you add a vertex to the frontier in the next round. And there's this switch that's like if you're if your size of the frontier plus app degrees is greater than some threshold, you're in dense mode, otherwise you're in sparse mode, where dense and sparse correspond to top, bottom, and top. Yeah, and I can show you an example for BFS. Like, their code is there, but the, so you would pass, for BFS, the update function is if your parents, the update takes in source and desk. If your parent of your desk is unvisited, your parent becomes the source, and you return yes, otherwise you return no. And the condition is just if you are unvisited, it takes in some vertex. If your parent's array has not been set, then you go to the next frontier. Questions?
this is again from a DSL five weighted or is it uh, um if it's a weighted graph, then you can just you can look up. I guess you would have a second array based on the index, and then you can look up both the vertex and the weight by the index. You would need to keep two arrays, one for index and one for edge, because you would do compare and swap on the edge. So um, you do compare and swap because the, like in this case, the negative one is just for the, uh, the vertex ID. So you do compare and swap on the vertex ID and you know who is the winner. And then based on knowing who is the winner, then you populate the index and the weight. Oh, so the winner condition is slightly more, it's not just parent of the equation for chromosome, but then it would be the comparison of the equation. Yeah, then you would have to like, uh, you would have to keep some metadata about the index. But you can find who won. And based on find, like, you know who won the compare and swap. Because at the end, after they're all done, like, one of them gets populated. Right. But like, you still have the big, the winner is chosen based on the weight. I mean, the cost of the weight. The winner is chosen arbitrarily, like, depending on thread scheduling. There's no, like, uh, well, in the non deterministic part that I skipped, you can, uh, one strategy is you just write the smallest, like, you use atomics to write the smallest one. And then in that case, the smallest one in terms of uh, edge ordering. And then like you write the smallest neighbor in terms of vertex ID. And then in that case, it's deterministic and you can also write the corresponding weight to that. So that's probably the simplest way. If you were to do it non-deterministically, you also have to keep track of the ID overall in the CSR, like the position in CSR. And then that will tell you both the, uh, the edge and the weight. Draw like one iteration bottom of CFS. I'm yep. having a hard time imagining. Let's go back. Okay, so okay, so let's say you have like you have a bunch of vertices, and then parents. Uh, I don't know parents. Negative. I'm just making them up. Okay. So the these uh, I guess this is a bad example because negative one is not proportional. Doesn't matter. It's an example. Negative one ten. Okay. So these have parents as negative one, and so looking at that, this is v. So if the parent of v is negative one, then you look at all the outgoing neighbors of the so you look at like so this means that these have not been visited yet these have already been visited so we're not gonna consider them so you look at everything like here um maybe it doesn't satisfy the like the denseness property but it's okay and so you look at all these neighbors uh okay that might yeah. and if if any of these are on the frontier, then you know that this was the parent, or you know that this is a parent. And so you can just put, yeah, if neighbor's on the frontier, you can put V on frontier next. Yes. Yes, okay. The trade-off is that basically you have to iterate on every single particle. But it only works well because you're assuming the frontier is large. It only works if you assume that the frontier is, yeah, the, the amount of useful work is similar to the total amount of work you're doing. And the, the win is that you save the contention. So there's a small, Aside that I want to talk about in the last part, which is uh, doing graph compression. So this is like according to your question, 
Uh, you can do the most easiest one to do is delta compression, which is you sort the edges within each neighbor list and you just encode the differences and you hope that the differences are smaller than the actual original vertex. So here, like the first one, you just encode it relative to the source vertex and the subsequent ones you encode relative to the one right before you. So here, this is source is zero. So two minus zero is zero. So that didn't save you anything, but here seven minus two is five. And that would save you five is smaller than seven. And, and you do the same thing for every, uh, every individual list in the CSR. And ideally you want to use fewer than uh, 32 or 64 bits, depending on your graph size, to store each value. So uh, even if you like reduce the value, you still have to do some trick to make it fit into fewer bits. Cause like you can store the number in 32 bits still, but it doesn't really help you. So yes. Is there any way to, um, like, suppose we have two vertices and they have the same edges? Uh, then we, we could have a data structure that where, like, the same CSR, but like the pointer would point to the same place because the edges are the same, right? Is there any, like, modification of that or, like, the same idea with the subset? For example, like a vertex, if it, its neighbor is like a subset of some neighborhood of other vertices, then it could basically also point to the Oh, okay, then offset would be different, so it wouldn't be actual elbow, let's say. Uh, or is it like the only way to compare the graph with the CSR? Uh, you can do, like you said, like if the graphs, if the vertices are, if the neighbor lists are exactly the same or even similar, mm -hmm. you can, you can like, then the meaning of offsets is different, but you can keep offsets as like a true pointer. Mm -hmm. And then you point to the location. And then maybe if they're exactly the same, then you don't need to change anything. If they're slightly different, you can keep deltas between the lists, either up here or down here somewhere. Yeah, good question. I think there are tricks that you can play like that. I've seen some papers. So, but this only works if you're like assuming that you have so many nodes that they're like bigger than 32 bits, like numbers in the first place. Uh, like really no, even if, so like when you just directly write the CSR, you have to define the type of everything in the CSR. Yes. Like this is probably, the most naive way is like a, an array of int 32, for example. And so no matter how big the edge is, it's going to take 32 bits. Oh, but because you've done this, now you can use a short. Uh, you could use a short. Well, I'm going to do like, I'm going to show you a slightly fancier thing because even with a, like with a short, you would have to guarantee that it fits in 16 bits and you may not necessarily be able to guarantee that. Sometimes this also be broken very easily. Like, you could have just one case where a vertex points to like the zeroth itself something, and then points to the last vertex, the biggest one. The difference is then, like, there's no, it doesn't help us at all because we still have the the difference is the large node value. We require all the bits for it, which means that like the best we could do would have to be like really hacky with the bits and bytes of the array. Instead of interpreting, like, because we wouldn't want to create like an 64 array or something, if we saw that big difference right there, we'd have to have different sizes, like heterogeneous sizes per segment between the first each array. Yeah. So, is the point that, like, so for example, if this was like zero and this was like int max, yeah. yeah, I agree, like, it wouldn't save you anything. I think this is more of an average case thing. In most cases, they are closer. And also, you can play reordering tricks to try to get them closer. Uh, like you reorder the vertices. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, good question. But in, in the worst case, yes, this will not help you. It's just in, in most cases, it actually does help you. Maybe because you did reordering. Yeah, you can, so one thing is like here, um, it's not delta compressed on the entire list. There's some special case, there's two cases. One is if you're the start of the list and one is if you're like in the, in the middle somewhere. And if you're in the start, you compress relative to the vertex ID. So 
uh, it may not be very large, so you don't have this huge discrepancy. Otherwise, you can also just directly compress the first one. Like you can just pretend that it's zero because um, you know where the start is. And with likelihood, it will be small, as you said. So like if you apply what I will show you in one minute, um, likely it will take a few bytes. I think what I will say is even less fancy than that. It's just like some, uh, some very simple thing. I will, I'll say it and then I, uh, we can discuss. It's probably not the best case thing, but it is a simple thing. So, does this make sense about the delta compression? Okay. So yeah. So we would. Uh, this is just some very simple compression scheme called variable length codes, and the way it works is that you set up front some some word size of k bits and the way and what you're going to do with k bit chunks is the first bit tells you first bit this is the k bit chunk and this is the value that you're trying to compress and basically what you're going to do is separate your value into k minus 1 bit sections and then you're going to fit those into k bit chunks and then the first bit is going to tell you whether there's more after that So, okay, so this example, suppose that we're trying to encode this thing using eight bit codes, but you can see that this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bits. So it's not gonna fit in an eight bit word. And so, but we don't wanna use 32 or 64 bits. And so how you separate that is you cut it up into seven bit chunks. This seven bits is the payload of the first word that you're going to use to encode the value. And then the, first bit is set to one because there's still more bits coming. And then after that, then there's another word and you put the remaining ones into the payload and the continue bit is zero because there's no more bits after that. And so this will take up to eight more bits than you possibly needed because like that uh, modulo the continue bit. But with 64 bit integers, the most that you can waste is eight in terms of overhead. So that is how you encode it. You encode it right to left, just in groups of seven, and you decode it left to right. Um, so the first thing that you decode will be the low seven bits. After that will be the next seven bits, and so on and so on. Um, so it's possible that we can have like multiple chunks of this, right? It's like we have a really large value, then we have a multiple bit maps, right? Mm -hmm. So why do we need actually this continue bit? Because like if we have multiple of those, we have already like the order, right? Because we need to traverse like the special order to get the value. Mm -hmm. So and while traversing, we will anyway like kind of list those, and we will know whether we have something next or not, right? So because why? if you want to encode many, you're not just encoding one int. Like imagine encoding CSR using the scheme. Mm -hmm. You have many ints. How do you know when one starts and when ends? Uh, um, so this is like an example with one, you're just trying to score one thing, yeah. but you're applying this to every, everything that you delta encoded in the CSR mm -hmm. individually. So how, like, and those are variable sizes in terms of minimum bits that they would need. So you need some way to tell like how big is each thing? How do you know when each value is done? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. I can I can talk about it more later. Yeah. Thinking about it, yes. Can you use more than the offsets uh, CSR to continue uh, This would be you would apply this onto the edges. That, so previously, like we did this subtraction, you would apply this thing onto each one of these things. And previously, like under naive implementation, like you would just make this entire thing a list of in 32 or 64 or whatever. Um, but instead, if you apply that thing, each thing will take some amount of eight bit words. And now the offsets already needs to change because the number of, like previously the offsets was equal to basically a prefix sum on the degree, but now it's no longer true because the things here may take more than one eight. So you can, there's two ways around it. One is you can keep two arrays in offsets. One is degree, one is like byte index. 
maybe there's only one way. <laughs> So this is this to our general data compression um, method. Yeah, this is not specific to graphs. Like, uh, sorry, this thing you can apply to any integer. Yeah. Um, though it may not work for negative integers in like choose complement because you like because like they are set by one in the top, so that that would be sixty four bits. So you may have to like you may have to flip it and then encode that it's negative somewhere else. Oh, okay. I had more, but I'm out of time. So I will just summarize and I'll upload the slides so you can see what I was going to say. Uh, in practice, graphs are large and sparse and also the access pattern and the degree distribution is regular. Sorry, you have a question. Okay. Um, the access pattern is irregular and dominated by memory access. You can improve the performance using algorithmic optimizations and by creating a locality. So uh, compression is one way to create the locality. I didn't talk about it, but you can do graph reordering to try to minimize the differences and also improve the locality by moving like uh, vertices that are accessed closer in time, closer together in index. And optimizations can work for some graphs, but not necessarily all graphs. It depends on the distribution and the type. Thank you.